Support for this podcast and the following message come from Broadway in Fort Lauderdale. Two worlds collide in Rodgers and Hammerstein's The King and I, hailed as breathtaking and exquisite by the New York Times. The musical is based on the 2015 Tony Award-winning Lincoln Center Theater production. The King and I boasts a score that features such beloved classics as Getting to Know You, Something Wonderful, and Shall We Dance. Don't miss The King and I at the Broward Center, November 20th through December 2nd. Tickets at BrowardCenter.org. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, the Rattledgen Broadcasting Network is proudly bringing to you Damn You Hollywood. And now here's your host, he's the Freddy to my Nancy, the Michael to my Lori, and the Jason to my assorted campers. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Robert Winfrey, yay! Assorted campers. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I All right. I don't I I don't watch much Friday the 13th. No, no, it's good. It's good because there's only a grand total of like three recurring characters and most of them aren't all that interesting. So no, that that's good. I I appreciate it. I thought it was I thought it would be better this week to go with horror icons for you and I than t- uh wrestling tag teams. Well, that's usually a better choice. I mean, there's like five good wrestling tag teams. <sighs> Come on, don't give me that noise. You know I'm <laughs> mostly correct about that. I am sighing in exasperation. Look, we have a guest, and he's got shit to do. Get on with it. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Damn You Hollywood, where Mark tries to kill me slowly more and more inside each week. When we started this series a couple of years ago, I was only 15% dead inside. I'm up to 30 now. <laughs> You're almost mostly dead? I'm getting there. Uh, tonight we will be reviewing Halloween, the most recent entry into that franchise. This one is intended as a straight sequel to the 1978 original. And uh, it's Mark's yearly schlep through horror for the sake of keeping me placated, I suppose. Uh, so we'll be getting into that. But as Mark mentioned, we do have a guest from the Unspoken Decade podcast. We have Chris. Chris, welcome to the show. How you doing? Doing well. Appreciate it. Alrighty. Mark, I have to poke fun at you for just a minute because I made you see a horror movie. And you're kind of a big weenie about horror movies. I am. So, first of all, I just wanted to publicly thank you for putting this on the list. On the schedule, I would like to thank the network executives for not dicking us over with this. Like they have with so many other things you've put on the schedule. <laughs> I don't want to talk about bunch, it. Literally, including like including a, a bunch today. <laughs> yeah, a half a dozen movies in the past two days. I don't. Could, wa, d- dear Warner Brothers, get your shit together. Love Mark. That would be nice. Uh, all right. So, I suppose before I get into my plot synopsis, just Chris, real briefly for you. I uh, 
Again, you're our guest here. I apologize in advance. <laughs> uh, what what inspired you to you know want to come on and talk about this? Um, just I'm a big fan of the uh, original Halloween and a few of the, some of the sequels. I'm not a big fan of. Uh, it's only like three that I actually like, but I'm a big fan of Carpenter, and uh, I've done a couple of podcasts with uh, Mark and uh, Jesse Starcher on um, source material. And so Jesse told me that you guys were doing this one on Halloween, and I thought it would be a good chance. I, a lot of my friends haven't seen it yet, so I haven't been able to really talk about it. So I figured this would be a good opportunity to talk to some people about it. Well, if nothing else, it is that. All right, here's everyone's spoiler warning. I'm about to go through this thing I would in like, your regularly scheduled plot synopsis. You're nicer to me tonight than normal, and I think it's because of the subject matter. But I want, I'm want i I'm going to be like an entitled millennial and say that I want more kudos I not only saw the new Halloween movie, but I sat through a double feature of the original and the new one. Eh? Get pat, pat me on the head and tell me I'm good. I think that actually probably helped your viewing experience for, the, for this one, because there's a lot of, especially in the final sequence, a lot of visual cues that directly reverse the positions of Michael and Laurie throughout them that have a really kind of fun, that cut play around with some of those expectations a bit that I there found was, enjoyable, and given that I doubt you'd seen the original, it probably helped your viewing experience. Oh, well, it absolutely did, and that's part of the reason why I did it. Um, and you guys can check out my comments on the movie right after I saw it on uh, on Popcorn Planet, uh, Popcorn Planet's channel on YouTube, uh, which is where Andy Signore, formerly of Screen Junkies, has uh, landed after his trying time. He's doing a... a a, rev- a show called Real Reviews with Real People, which is literally people that were in the theater. <laughs> he just puts the camera on him and says, hey, what'd you think of this? Um, so I was there for one of those tapings, and it happened to be this particular double feature. That was fun. I'll probably do that again. But, um, yeah, there were literally some mirror-for-mirror mirror shots uh, between the first one and the second one, which I giggled at every time that happened, like an, like an idiot. I mean, look, if I really wanted to cheese you off about Halloween, I'd make you watch the two Rob Zombie versions of Halloween. <laughs> That's a pass, sir. I'm not, re- I'm not Which quite I re- quite enjoy, actually. I'm not quite ready for that jelly. Go ahead with your plot synopsis, sir. <laughs> All right. Again, this one is set as a canonical sequel to the original Halloween, John Carpenter's original set in 1978. So everything after that, for the purposes of this film, didn't happen. Much as we all like to forget Season of the Witch, we get to... Or Halloween 5, God, which is so bad, I believe it's in public domain. Because the curse of Michael Myers is just... You can find it on all kinds of anthology collections in, like, $2 bins at Walmart, because nobody wants that thing. But we are set 40 years after the original. Uh, We open with a couple... (laughs) Mark, if I were a sensitive person, and again, 30% dead inside, I'd be inclined to feel a little bit attacked about our intro to this movie being a couple of true crime podcasters and investigative journalists (laughs) (laughs) trying to get an interview with Michael Myers, uh, which they, they get an audience, but Michael doesn't speak. We are introduced to the stand-in for Dr. Loomis, uh, which makes... He just reminded me how awesome Donald Pleasance was. Who was Dr. What? Name is escaping me. I can't recall his name either. Sartain. That's it, Sartain. And they talk a little bit about Michael. Sartain gives hints that he's crazy, which pays off later. But Michael has no reaction to even his old William Shatner mask. Because for those of you unaware, the original Halloween mask is just a Captain Kirk mask that was blanched of its color. Which is great. Just, yeah. uh, again, he has no reaction. The podcasters go off to try and get an interview with Lori as Michael is being prepared to be moved away from a state psychiatric facility to a dark hole in the bottom of Supermax, which is, quite frankly, where he belongs. Uh, their interview with Lori doesn't go well because Lori is traumatized, is just profoundly not having any of their crap, uh, as paranoid, and has a really sweet get-up in all all things considered for her (laughs) her house setup. It's really nice. Uh, We also meet Lori's 
daughter and her granddaughter. The actresses, I can't recall, but they are... Their names were Karen and Allison, who still live in Haddonfield. It's and Judy Greer and... For, and uh, it's Judy Greer and Andy uh, Matachek. Okay. Schmageggy. Got it. Still in your bets. Uh, who... And there's a little bit of teenage drama around the daughter. Naturally, there's family strife. Naturally, because Lori's a little crazy. Doesn't mean she's wrong, just means she's a little crazy. Uh, the final impetus for stuff actually happening in the movie after the setup is Michael breaking out of his prison transport. He murders a couple of people, including, uh, again, the officers in charge of transporting him, a 12-year-old boy. I was so glad he did that. Not that I have anything against small children, but this is Michael. He just murders people, and he doesn't care. Michael then kills the podcasters in a really great sequence. To retrieve his mask, he then begins another massacre through Haddonfield, looking for Lori and her daughter, Lori's daughter. Er, she, for the family, he's, he's after the bloodline. I don't know. I, I'm referencing too many bad movies with that singular line there. Jeez. A uh, bunch of cannon fodder characters are executed violently. Uh, Sartain go reveals his insanity in that he just really wants to know what Michael feels when he kills. So he kills one of the police officers, a sheriff's deputy played by Will Patton, to help keep Michael alive because Will Patton was going to shoot him in the head because he's a sane person. <laughs> I love that the occasionally like sane people in this movie just have even crazier things happen to them to prevent them from being sane. Uh, this culminates with a showdown between Lori, Karen, and Allison in Lori's quasi-fortified location. I, I, there's not much plot here, but there's a lot of great stuff that we'll get to in a minute. It turns out that Lori's paranoia had also manifested itself in creating a gas chamber of sorts to trap Michael and then murder him with fire which is a good way to do it if you're going to kill someone um, we, Michael might have survived it's left a little bit ambiguous especially if you stay till the end of the credits when over the last bit you could actually hear Michael breathing but he is stuck in a in, in an inferno in the bite basement of this house the strode women escape get in the back of a truck and are you know, given a ride back to town there's a couple of that shot's reminiscent of a couple of things. Again, Michael's actual fate is left to touch ambiguous because sequels. And that's that's basically the major plot points. Again, there's a few things that I brushed over because they're they're more to give a bit of depth to some of the characters or some of the cannon fodder in places. So, uh, Chris, I'll start with you. Uh, where do you want to start with this? What did you real What did you enjoy about it, if anything? Um, I enjoyed almost everything about it. I, uh, I thought it was great. Um, I haven't really heard a lot of negative reaction. I know there are, there are some bad reviews out there, and I've seen some people on Twitter uh, talk about it, but mostly I've seen positive uh, feedback. And I, I like the uh, fact that they dis uh, they got rid of the connection between Lori and Michael. They're not related. Um, the only reason he goes after Lori in this movie at all is because the doctor arranged it. Um, he was just murdering people at random uh, until he, you know, finds himself in Lori's stronghold with her daughter at the very end. Um, I, I've, Carpenter never intended for them to be brother and sister. That was something that was added when they wanted to make a sequel. And um, it kind of permeated the rest of the franchise after that, but... I like it a lot more when Michael Myers is just, you know, a murderer. He doesn't care about who it is. Or he doesn't have any rhyme or reason to it. He's just going to kill whoever he comes in contact with um, that he can get away with. All right, Mark, again, you're not the biggest horror fan, so but you did seem to enjoy this. So uh, what are your thoughts? Where did you enjoy specific sequences you might have found interesting? Let me uh, reiterate what I said on Real Reviews um, and make it sound a little bit more coherent <laughs> considering at the time that I was giving those remarks I was uh, apparently I had pneumonia and didn't know it um, again 
<laughs> Again, yeah. Well, at least I can breathe this time. Uh, what I liked about this movie were, were two things in particular. One, the use of tension, especially in a horror movie, really especially in a slasher flick, is probably of the utmost importance. Um, tension and uh, atmosphere. No, there's not a lot of plot here, but the movie is... Oh, gosh, what? Um, 105 minutes. 105 minutes long, and I would say about, like, 70% of it is, the you know, these quiet, uh, atmospheric, creepy shots. All right, you know, uh, whether at Lori's house or in the neighborhood, people are constantly screaming... And they didn't overuse the uh, the jump scare you know, or the fake out jump scare now, which is which is the big thing, which is to get you on that second shot. Um, everything was was used uh, sparingly, and you're 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 with, especially in the end sequence, you're with Laurie as she's going around the house, and you know it does it doesn't have that creepy kind of haunted house feel to it. You know where every you know where you're expecting to see something gross every time the camera changes angles, which is what I liked. You know, I liked the fact that this was a naturally scary movie because uh, you you don't know what's going to happen next. It really does play on your sense of anticipation and anxiety. The other speaking of anxiety, the other thing that I really liked about this was how it dealt with post traumatic stress disorder. Uh, for those that haven't listened to us before, because you're here because of Chris and the Unspoken Decade, uh, I'm a social worker, I'm a licensed clinical social worker in Florida, and I deal with the mentally ill uh, on a daily basis uh, in the uh, criminal justice system. I get a lot of post traumatic stress disorder, a lot of PTSD for guys who have been in prison, and while I was not expecting this to be a <laughs> a feature documentary on the effects of PTSD uh, or how to deal with it, I did like the fact that it that the film acknowledges that it's a thing. It's a thing that'll happen to somebody you know who experiences what Laurie Strode experienced in 1978, and it didn't wallow to you know or point too long at it, but just enough to know, hey, it's there, it's a thing, it's real, it should be taken seriously. This is how it affects people. I thought uh Jamie Lee Curtis did an excellent job of not Tom Hardying the scenery. And if you want to know what I mean by that, go listen to our Venom review. Um <laughs> she she plays it straight. You know, the producers and the you know the director of this thing and the writers I think treated PTSD with a degree of care while not get while not necessarily getting lost in it, you know, with keeping the audience like, hey, we're here for a fun slasher flick, let's not forget that. And I don't think they did, but they rode that line. See, cuz if cuz if they spent too long with it, you lose sort of the fun of the feature and then this becomes kind of sad, right? If you spent, you know, if if um if you give it short shrift, you're not really paying respect to it. It's a very fine line, and uh, you know, in, with a lot of movies that deal with the mental, with uh, serious mental health issues, they usually don't get them. And I want to shoot the people who wrote the film because they don't understand what it is they're writing about. I thought they got just enough uh, to get through the film without me feeling like they had no idea what they were what they were talking about. The other thing I really liked about this, and this is this was just a, a particular sequence, <laughs> I, the, I'm sure Robert saw this coming because he sees everything coming, but I really enjoyed the the, the 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 crazy doctor bit. I thought that was hilarious. Just yeah, you know, the the doctor suddenly like you know needing Michael to start killing again so he can understand him and his you know to understand the animal in his natural environment, and then getting his comeuppance because of it. I, that whole I could draw a circle around that whole sequence and be like, "Yep, I'm good with just this." <laughs> this was funny as hell to me, and and very enjoyable. So I liked all of that and how the granddaughter reacts to being trapped in this. You know, it's like, "Hey, I thought I was being saved here, and you're sort of setting me up as bait now." Um, Turns out I'm in here with gender bent Har uh, Harley Quinn. <laughs> so um, I really, you know. I, as we've joked about in the past, I'm not a huge fan of horror. I don't enjoy being frightened. 
It's not my thing. But if I'm going to watch horror movies, I would much prefer the ones that deal in tension and anxiety than gore and grossness. And to that effect, Sunday's episode of Family Guy, where Cleveland blows the snot rocket on a shrunken Stewie and Brian, literally made me barf my breakfast. This is what you get for patronizing Seth MacFarlane's work. Just you know, I'll it. go ahead and give you that one. Ha, ah, finally. <laughs> finally, he just goes along with my zinger at Seth MacFarlane. <laughs> that was so gross, I couldn't take it. I, I was like, I'm sitting there, you know, eating my leftover mashed potato from KFC, because that's the Breakfast of Champions. And, I'm, you know, and then it's like, zip, whoop, whoop. That was the end of me. I was like, okay. And fast forward. Uh... Yeah, I agree with you. It's one of the things that it's one of the good things about a well done slasher movie, any of them. There's certainly inventive kills and there is violence, there's supposed to be, but there's a lot more that is about building up tension than there is just, hey, let's rack up a high body count. And which is again a very good thing. It speaks highly of this film that they managed to kinda of do both. I mean he gets a decent body count going. Yeah, it's Probably the highest body count in the in the franchise. I haven't checked, but I would. It's like fifteen or something like that. It's up there. Yeah, I mean, Mike uh, Michael Myers doesn't have the highest body count. I mean, he's not Jason hacking through a cornfield full of kids. <laughs> doesn't that? I mean, you if you guys are you know big into horror films and slasher films in particular, doesn't the high body count thing get monotonous after a while? It can. Sure. Again, a lot of it it's depends still, it's on... It's like comfort food, like, for horror fans, yeah. though. It's yeah. just, you know, they like it, so it's okay if it's excessive. <laughs> it's, you know, the leftover mashed potatoes from KFC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing about that is if you're going for a high body count, inventiveness of kills counts for a whole lot. I mean, one of my favorites of all time, actually comes from uh, w- from uh, the movie that starred Kane, See No Evil, when he kills someone with a cell phone. <laughs> he shoves it down this girl's throat and then punches it while it's lodged there. It's great. <laughs> Terrific. I actually really enjoy that movie. All let, me, considered. let me turn the tables around here. What did you think of the mental health elements uh, as represented in this film? I agree with you. You know, because you don't just walk away from something like what happened to her. There's going to be after effects. There's going to be issues. And especially if you consider that, again, the original is set in 1978, the psychological field of study about this type of thing was much more limited than it is now. So her having gone through a bunch of either, like, misdiagnoses, bad treatments, and just saying to hell with it, I'm going to live in paranoia and preparedness and hypervigilance. Let me let me address that for one second, because this got brought up on Real Reviews, and I wasn't able to engage in the discussion when it was occurring between Andy and one of the female co-hosts, but they talked about, you know, the intervening years, and I really wish I could have said something at the time, because they were like, what was she, what was she doing, just waiting there, you know, waiting in the house for, uh, you know, for... <laughs> For forty some odd years, and you know, until this particular day, like no, she did get all. She did, listen to the damn movie. She had two marriages. She had a daughter. There were, you know, I'm sure there were ebbs and flows in her life where she was trying to get past things and she just couldn't. You know, and she would go through depressions. This is all in the movie. She says these things through, you know, they're not not in one long monologue, but they're peppered throughout, and the rest is inference. But. She she goes I mean, through these. It's pretty heavily inferred she's a recover implied rather that she's a recovering alcoholic. Right. So you have these ebbs and flows, and if you can imagine, you know, all of these bits of her life, you know, being fairly lengthy time periods, and then added together, yeah, I can see where she got to where she did because you don't know how long she's been living like a hermit in, in a you know in a marine bunker. <laughs> you know, for she that could have been for the last ten years. And the pre in the two preceding marriages, well, the, her daughter had been there and had been raised in that location. But mm-hmm. yeah, but you don't know if it if it was as fortified as she made it out to be, um, or if she kept the property in her name and then got married after her ch- after that kid got. I mean, like, there's so much time. There's so much stuff that could happen along that period of right. time. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is, it is absolutely conceivable that she could have lived a life that resulted in her uh, in her hermitage. The way that it, the way that it's shown in the movie, 
at this time. It is it's absolutely conceivable that things happened, and we're just get we're just getting a picture of what's happening now. But there were a whole slew of things happening before that. Again, two marriages, raising a daughter, alcoholism, you know, periods of depression, periods of mania, possibly. I, I you know, I, it's it's almost like. You know, because they're they're doing this sort of soft reboot now in 2018. Now I want to now I want them to go back, get a different actress to play Jamie Lee Curtis, and I want to see those. I want to see those years. Like we don't don't call it Halloween, call it something else. But I want to see I want to see her struggling with mental illness for 40 years. Mark, there are Hallmark movies that deal with that. I know, but I want to see this one made into a Hallmark movie. Ha! Ah, take that, horror fans. You know when that first. Uh... The first trailer dropped for this one, and it showed Lori, you know, as a recluse, basically in training and uh, clearly post post traumatic stress. Uh, my first instinct was like, if she's not, um, if Lori's not his sister, if all these other sequels are not part of the continuity anymore, it seemed to me like a stretch that she would be that affected forty years later. With she only experienced that one night. Um, and then they kind of address it in the movie when the the uh, granddaughter's uh, guy friend, like, hey, shouldn't she just get over it? It was just one guy. And their reaction was basically like, just shut the fuck up. <laughs> like, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what it's like to experience something like that. And I think that was like a a way to tell the audience who might be thinking that, like, you don't know what, you know, what that kind of thing does to someone's mental health. You're absolutely right, Chris, and I don't want to take us off on a tangent, so I'm going to make this very quick, but if the three of us uh, experienced the same sort of you know, stimuli, we, would, we three would react differently. You know, um, people have their, their own individual uh, ability to, you know, to, to deal with you know, certain stimuli, you know, like I said. So you know, a situation where, where Lori, uh, you know, saw her friends get stabbed and was nearly killed herself somebody else in that same position might have gotten over it years later not everybody that went to Vietnam came back with PTSD uh, but certainly a variety did and not everyone that came back with PTSD dealt with it poorly some of them were you know were able to deal with it and still leave you know lead fruitful and you know and eventful lives or whatever and some did <laughs> some were uh, did terrible things to themselves and everyone around them you know, you, you never can tell, and I think that, and I'm glad the movie addressed that and then moved on, because, you, because again, you know, that's not really the point of the movie. The point of the movie was entertain people by murdering people on screen. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, we also got some pretty decent, you know, sequences. Uh, uh, probably my favorite, again, apart from looking at the final one in Laurie's house, is kind of, uh, in places, a, deliber- a straight reversal of the closing sequence of the original Halloween. Uh, again, I really liked when he killed the podcasters in that horrible bathroom. <laughs> uh, I mean, one of the things that they had dropped in the trailer was that scene of him just kind of reaching over the top of that bathroom of that stall door and just dropping a bunch of teeth. Into yeah, the teeth. Somebody's head. <laughs> it's good and, to know Michael look, Myers has a sense of humor. I mean, we all have different. You know, everybody has different things about. Uh, the human anatomy that when you see will kind of like <laughs> affect you differently. I got a thing for teeth, man. I, <laughs> not so much, you know, bad teeth, but, you know, broken, yanked out of your head, stuff like that. Uh, it, that, again, like that kind of sets, you know, deliberately, more deliberate word choice here. That does kind of set my teeth on edge. So that was a, that was a good one. So, uh, I, mean, one again, com- I like the way it was all set up. I like that he does a lot of stuff in the background. Uh, again, it's another mm-hmm. callback to the original, where a fair amount of what Michael does is just kind of hang out in the background out of focus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you can see he... him swinging on that mechanic in the window. Oh, that's when the such guy a good walks shot. Into, into paper as gas, yeah. My they one... don't draw attention to it or anything. It's My one complaint about the movie is I wish I had... I wish they had either not cut or shot and then included how he got off the damn bus. I mean, yeah. I, when I think about Silence of the Lambs and however, you know, and how they transport Hannibal Lecter, 
where he's in the straight jacket in a cage with the mouth guard on, surrounded by panthers, you know, in, in a you know in a in, in a box that says beware of the beware of the leopard, and inside of another box that says biohazard. You know, it's like they 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 take like extra care to move Hannibal Lecter. This asshole, they're just like meh. <laughs> Throw him on the bus and some chains. We'll be fine. And then it's like, well, how did he get out of it then? You know, like, I want to know. Like, I, I understand it's not an important element of the movie. All you need to know is he got off. But I feel yeah. like it was another opportunity to show his viciousness. And it really could... And because they never show you his face, his real face, it really could have been, you know, directed artfully, if if you can say such things about a horror film. Um, yeah, part of me wonders if... And this is the weirdest thing about this, now that I'm thinking about it. The only guy whose report we have about what happened was Sartain. Yeah. So Part do we, of me wonders if he didn't go back and let him go. Yeah. <laughs> if he, oh, Which, he, if midway through the trip he just uncuffed him and said, go to town? Yeah, he, he came up with an excuse to go back there, undid one of his handcuffs, just because, again, his whole thing is, I want to see... You and your natural environment. I want to. I have a theory about the relationship between, in horror terminologies, the killer and the final girl, and how that relates to each other. And I wish to test my hypothesis. So, yeah, just let him out, and we're going to see what happens. <laughs> in real life, by the way, they'd have drugged him up so much that he was never would have woken up on that bus ride. <laughs> They'd have shot him so full of Haldol and Thorazine and shit and dishwater and fucking whatever else they had they had around. There's no way he's awake during that trip. Just just saying. Sure. I mean, well, sort of. I I would have liked to have seen. There's this weird thing about Michael where he is a a person, but there's also just enough force of nature. Yeah, there's just enough of that, you know, like he got hit by when Will Patton ran him over with the car. Mm -hmm. I was waiting for when Sartain goes down to check on him, him just stabbing him and then yeah. sitting up. <laughs> you know, so I would have liked maybe even a shot where they do dope him, and just midway through the trip, it, it, the effects wear off you know, sooner than anticipated. Yeah, there was an an element to Michael that. You know, the guy whacks him in the head with a crowbar in the bathroom, and he just shrugs it off. Um, Gets shot several times and just keeps Yeah, coming. he, he uh, smashes the doctor's head like a pumpkin Even uh, the... with his foot, which I'm not sure is possible. Maybe. Eh, I mean, he... Possible, really... but... Really different. I was gonna say even even Schwarzenegger's Terminator takes you know who's a fucking robot <laughs> takes time out to patch up his wounds in the movie. Yeah. Meanwhile, this guy has got uh, Deadpool's powers. <laughs> He's annoying. He, no regeneration, sir. Regeneration. I thought that was implied. No, no, it's just the annoyance. That's the only thing keeping Deadpool alive is his continued annoyance of other humans. Do you see what I put up with, Chris? Do you see? Do you hear my <laughs> Drop pain? Drop him in the middle of the wilderness with no one to actually annoy. He's dead in five minutes. That is the source I like of his the Deadpool movies, but um, I'm not a fan of the Deadpool uh, comic book character. So I'm not. I'm kind of straddling the fence here. <laughs> Terrific. I know that. I I appreciate that. I mean, I hate. I hated the movies, and I don't care for the character in comics either, but there's a variety of perspectives on <laughs> that, and I'm prepared to... And, uh, the majority of them are valid. Moving on. Uh, Chris, is there anything else you wanted to talk about with you know likes, dislikes, uh, what you would have liked to have seen? Um, I can't think of anything that was missing that I was kind of looking forward to. Um, I really like the, uh, the final sequence with... Lori and her daughter, uh, or actually specifically with Lori's daughter and her granddaughter, and uh, the gotcha moment, which played like a champ with the crowd that I watched it with. Sure. And I thought it was really effective. I thought it was really, you know, I wasn't, I was fooled, you know, just like Michael was. Uh, uh, I, I thought she was panicking, and it was all a ploy to get Michael to show himself, and and that played really well with the crowd. I really liked that uh I moment. mistakenly said this was Judy Greer's best work, and then everyone around me was like, clearly you've never seen Arrested Development. Hell yes. <laughs> and then something else that she was in was she has mismatched nipples. Um, <laughs> She's usually good, and I haven't seen like a ton of her stuff, but I, I'm normally a fan of hers. 
I don't know. She she's taken to playing in a lot of things. The um, she's about number five or six on the Adrian scale. Uh, do you know what the Adrian scale is? I'm not familiar. The Adrian scale is a is a damn you Hollywood invention, along with more dinosaurs. More is spelled O M O A R. Um, <laughs> but the Adrian scale is based on Adrian Balboa, who's the mm-hmm. worst wife in the history of movies. <laughs> And if, if you're a ten on the Adrian scale, you're a terrible, awful nag, and your hu- and your husband doesn't. You don't deserve your husband, and he should have shot you and left you in a trunk somewhere. If you're a one on the Adrian scale. You're mildly irritating. Um, and Judy Greer has five. Uh, she's around. A, Judy Greer has taken to, to playing like a like a five or a six on the Adrian scale, and like in like the, her last couple of movies. I'm not familiar enough with her work to... I mean, I, I remember her vaguely from Arrested Development, because Arrested Development I, is one of my favorite shows. But She's beyond that, a... she does she does a lot of just comedy that in no way, shape, form, or fashion appeals to me, so I just don't watch it. She's kind of a that guy, like a, the, the female version of a that guy. Like, you see her pop up in a lot of stuff, and you usually recognize her, but... Oh yeah, she's uh, she's she's got Langzex and Ant Man. Yeah, she, <laughs> yeah. she's the she's the she's a terrible uh, ex wife in Ant Man. She's uh she's ter- she's a terrible wife in this movie. Um, though she has that great moment where she does the gotcha thing with Michael. Um, a lot of the stuff I have not seen her in, and uh, she was she was a terrible mom in Jurassic World. And I'm not sure what she was in Tomorrowland, but Tomorrowland's terrible, so whatever. <laughs> Tomorrowland is terrible. Oh, she's an archer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was oh, another yes, one where she everyone goes to ar- Cheryl in ar- Archer. Okay, everyone oh, around right. me was like, "You clearly don't watch Archer or Arrested Development." But it was those two things, and they would be right. <laughs> no, Archer is great. <laughs> Someday I'll okay. watch it. All right, no, Robert. Why don't you uh, why don't you wrap up here? Because I know uh, you would st- you started and then we we cut in with our thoughts with whatever it was you were talking about. So why don't you wrap up with your thoughts? I mean, I have no problems basically at all with this movie. I mean, they, there's a few things I might have done differently. Again, I think you mentioned that you know, his escape sequence would have been cool to at least start. If we don't, even if you don't want to see the whole thing, just you know. One of those like loud noise smash cut as he starts wrapping his handcuff chains around a guard's neck. Uh, something like that might have been nice. But it, it's a very minor nitpick. I like that they gave a lot of... The, and even the cannon fodder characters kind of had something. They weren't just there for cannon fodder. I mean, they were, but they were also given you know a little bit of stuff to do. Because the movie doesn't just go for a high body count. It goes for... Here's a character, and you might know they're going to die, but you need to be able to build a little bit of tension around it. I was sad that Michael didn't kill the annoying little black kid, because you'd think he'd have learned from Jason about Reggie the Reckless. But, uh, apparently this is, like, the great bane of masked serial killers (laughs) and, and slasher monsters is... And a mildly annoying black child. They just can't do anything about it. They are helpless in it's the face kryptonite. of this. It's um, their um, I mean, did uh, did anybody um, when when I uh, watched it with a crowd, the the scene with the baby, there was a palpable dread in the auditorium. Yeah, I was worried. Like, is he gonna fucking stab this baby? Uh, which because they had already shown him, you know, snap that kid's neck, which was like a twelve year old kid. Um, but I mean, a, the baby would have been a little too far, I guess. But the the crowd definitely was worried about it, and I thought twice when he walked into that room with the crying baby. I was worried. <laughs> like, oh, are they? Because re- like I can see the argument that yeah, he would just stab the crying baby, but right. I don't remember how they resolve that. I know that he goes in there and they don't show anything, but uh, um... he just walks through the room and leaves. Okay, it's weird because he goes in there. He, he looks does at look the at the baby. baby and the I baby think. stops crying. <laughs> <laughs> and then he turns and leaves. <laughs> the, the baby knew better. Let's go around the table real quick, and then we'll move on to the next segment. Um, unless you have any other burning desires. At the end of the credits, Michael's breathing is heard. Implication being, he somehow lived through a blazing fire. Um, so, 
Robert, I'll start, let you and then Chris and then I'll uh, I'll clean up. Alive and do you want a sequel? Uh, probably alive because you can't kill Michael Myers like you can't kill Jason Voorhees. It can't be done. Do I want to see a sequel? I would be interested because this I liked this one so much. There's a lot again. There's a lot of callbacks to the original. It's shot in a very intelligent style. It's well put together. There's some inventive kills. There's enough character development to keep them from just being mindless, annoying cannon fodder. And it's basically what you want out of a slasher movie. And if they're able to replicate this, I would have no problem with a sequel, all things considered. Chris? Um, I mean, I I have to say he's probably not dead. Um, I would like this to be the last... You know, I want to see more Halloween movies, and if uh, if David Gordon Green and Danny McBride and Jamie Lee Curtis all want to do another one, uh, another a sequel of this, I'm sure it would be good. I would prefer that if Bloomhouse is going to keep with Halloween, that they just start it over and uh, take it away from the Laurie Strode angle um, and just kind of start fresh with a new. You know, Michael Myers murders his sister when he's six and escapes when he's 21 and and kind of just start from there. But that's probably not going to happen. I'm sure we're going to see another um, Jamie Lee Curtis as Laurie Halloween movie probably two years from now. And I'm kind of fine with it. It's not what I would prefer, but I'm sure it'll be good. I would like to pitch a terrible idea, if you guys don't mind. Oh, sure. Come on. It's not, <laughs> not? a damn you Hollywood without a terrible idea from Mark that some studio executive will think, hey, that's a good idea. All right. So to the intern that's listening to this podcast, wake up. Okay, here it comes. This is what you, in particular, have been tuning into this podcast for. One of my terrible movie ideas. Okay? So I think he's dead. Okay? I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go against the grain, like I always do. I'm going to say Mike Myers is dead. He's finished. He has burnt to ash. Uh, and he's not coming back. <laughs> That being said, I would like to really embrace the the, the, uh, the political atmosphere as it is right now. Very pro-woman, very pro-girl power, hashtag me too. What I would like to see is, um, let, let's take all the elements, transgenderism, let's put it all in there. I want to see the granddaughter, um, and let's take a page out of Scream, okay? I want to see the granddaughter take up the mantle of Michael Myers but you don't know it's the granddaughter because she's running around in the in you know in the Dan band uh, mechanic jumpsuit and the mask and it looks like a dude and you know it walks like a dude it talks like a dude well it doesn't talk but it walks like a dude it, it kills like a dude and it's all the Michael Myers tropes that we love but you know but the, you know when they do the Scooby Doo unmasking it's Laurie Sturge's granddaughter uh five, ten years from where we left her in this movie. With a brand new cast of characters, no Jamie Lee Curtis. That's what I want to see. You see what I have to deal with now. T- Terrible <laughs> idea. Yeah, isn't it? It's horrible, right? It's just the it's worst. It's totally... In every way. It's totally pandering to the social justice warriors. I'm hoping they run with this idea. I'm hoping yes, they... I'm, uh, I'm, you know, and maybe get, maybe cast uh, Michelle McCarthy. I hear she's big with women. Um, no pun intended. So, Melissa McCarthy? Yeah, sorry, Melissa McCarthy. So let's get her in there and maybe have it directed by Paul Feig. All right. To the unpaid intern who just had to transcribe bits of that, I want you to know something. You, faceless, nameless individual out there. This is the worst idea Mark has ever come up with. Is it worse? I'm glad it could be a part of it. Is it worse and than... And that includes it, is it, wait, his wait. position that raptors should have laser packs on their back. Is it worse than Thundar the Barbarian versus Herculoids, which I'm still working on? Yes. I mean, if they're going to keep making those Jurassic World movies, you might as well throw the laser packs on there. Thank you. Yes. Mark, this is almost as bad as your insistence that there be another Transformers movie starring Ma- starring Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> they should never stop okay, making those. This is just the worst. All right. It's well. so bad you gave my dog an asthma attack. 
<laughs> and on that note... It is the worst, and anyone who decides to move forward with this, I don't care who you are, I don't care where you are, I will find you. And I will exact vengeance. <laughs> I, I forgot when I said I take a to wind up purging this from my own brain with head trauma to make sure the idea never germinates and spreads further. I'm willing to put my head through a wall to do it. No, I said take a page from the screen, which means in future sequels, Mike Myers is always a different girl. <sighs> Say again, what was that? Just stop. <laughs> I, I, I had to clarify the take a page from the Scream uh, book, which is in, uh-huh. in subsequent sequels to what I just pitched, Mike Myers is always a different girl. It's always a brand new girl. Sure. This is <laughs> just the worst. Aren't you glad you came on this show, Chris? All right. No <laughs> All right. With that said, since I just pitched a money idea, how about we talk about the money? Well, a money losing idea. Here comes the money. Here we go. Money talks. Here comes the money. Hey, Bloomhouse doesn't lose money. Dollar, dollar. Dollar, dollar. No, but Paul Feig does. Uh, I'm glad we kept with the theme of talking through the damn music. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Halloween. It was a scream. And our $10 million budget... Worldwide, as of this recording, it has made $96 million, making it phenomenally successful. Which is weird, because it's like the 30th or something most successful movie this year. I mean, it's so far down the list, it's almost laughable. On the other hand, when your budget is $1.50, and you know, you know, and you make 10 bucks, it's, wow, you're wildly successful. And, you know, you didn't have to have huge explosions and CGI and shit like that. Or, you know, your entire cast turning into ash. So, good on you, folks. Mr. Uh, David Gordon and Danny McBride, congratulations. You got a wiener. Um, Here's how the weekend went. Obviously, it was the number one movie of the weekend. Uh, It beat out Venom. Uh, Venom dropped from one to three. Uh, A Star is Born stayed at number two. It's still, you know, it's still out there doing good, making money. Goosebumps stayed at four. First Man fell from 3 to 5. The Hate You Give actually rose from 9 to 6. I'm guessing, yeah, it opened in a bunch more theaters is what happened there. Smallfoot, or as my wife uh, called it, uh, Liberal Propaganda, dropped from 5 to 7. True story, Chris, by the way. Um, Night School dropped from 6 to 8. Bad Times of the El Royale, 7 to 9. And uh, something called Old Man and the Gun, Rose from 15 to 10. Rounding out the top 20 was a house with a clock in its walls, free solo, Sisters Brothers, Gosnell's Trial of America's Biggest Serial Killer, Colette, Crazy Rich Asians, The Nun, Beautiful Boy, and quote, and uh, sorry, A Simple Favor, and then finally debuting at number 20. I believe this is the indie film with uh, Jonah, directed by Jonah Hill, mid 90s. Ugh. Good on Gosnell scoring that big of an opening. Can You Ever Forgive Me also debuted this weekend. It debuted at number 23 with 161,000 as of uh, this recording. Where we stand for the year worldwide. None of no, There's no change from last week. <laughs> this moderate change, but not a whole lot. Um, Venom has risen to number 13. It is right behind Hotel Transylvania. So right now, Sony's top two movies are number 13 and 12. Um, I don't remember if Mission Impossible was number five la- the last time we talked, but if it wasn't, it is now. Deadpool dropped to six. Ant-Man and the Wasp, I think, has stayed at number seven. Ready Player One has stayed at number eight. Operation Red Sea and Detective Chinatown are 10. The Meg 11. Um... Rampage has stayed at 14, Solo at 15. Oh, poor Lucasfilm. Um, Don't feel bad for them. They brought that on themselves. Uh, Jesse, uh, where do you go? Robert Winfrey's favorite movie this year, Fifty Shades Free at number 17. The Nun has shot up to 18. I mean, really, if you're going to keep Bob with that bit, you should start throwing that at Ronnie Adams, not me. I'm doing it mostly for Chris's benefit. He hasn't been on the show, (laughs) so I'm kind of pulling out some of the old hits from earlier in the year. Uh, Peter Rabbit. What time is Peter Rabbit? At number 20. So that's where we are. Now, as far as projections, uh, next week is Halloween, and there's nothing. 
<laughs> just nothing coming out. Um, you know, the, the, for this Friday is the 26th. The only new movies coming out this weekend are Hunter Killer and Indivisible. So I suspect mm. that Halloween is number one again, and it probably makes it to 200 million. I would I would imagine. And it only has one more weekend to make any decent kind of money because it's going because after that November is chock full of goodness. It's got um, and it really isn't. I mean, as far as people going to see those movies instead of Halloween, it is uh, Friday, November second is Bohemian Rhapsody and the Nutcracker in the Four Realms. So there's your kids and there's everybody else. Um, yeah, the- there's a lot. I, I'm the crazy thing. I'm not sure which is going to be a bigger drug induced flashback: the story of the notorious drug using rock band from the 70s or the Nutcracker in the Four Realms um, and then the ninth is Dr. Zeus uh, Dr. Zeus is the Grinch the girl uh, in the spider's web a new dragon tattoo story an overlord I would imagine you know again th- all of those eat into any good potential audience that uh, hasn't seen Halloween just yet the following week is a Harry Potter movie Forget it. It's going to own the box office and make a billion dollars. Um, and then... You going to stand by that? Maybe not a billion, but close. Uh, and then if, after that, you have the 21st, and this is Thanksgiving weekend. You've got Creed 2, Ralph Breaks the Internet, and Robin Hood, which no one except me will see. And then uh, that pretty Why much... Why are even you seeing it? Have what, you Ralph? not seen the trailers for this movie? <laughs> it looks it looks fucking terrible, but I threw it on the schedule at the beginning of the year. I built an entire week of podcasts around it, and now I'm committed, and so are you. Lucky dog, yeah, you. No. you. You at one point <laughs> in the very recent past said, you know, there's nothing stopping you from reviewing and talking about whatever you want. I might not watch that movie and just find something else to talk about. Don't, don't do that. You're going to watch Robin Hood, and we're going to talk about it. Just, just you wait. Um we'll see. You can just watch that King Arthur movie. They look like they're the exact same thing. In fairness, I didn't hate the King Arthur movie. Don't get me wrong. Not very good. But it also bombed. It. Bombed and, and bombed you bailed on, Yeah, it bombed and you bailed on our review. I don't think I bailed. I had I was going through chemo at the time. I got an excuse to get out of it. Thank you very much. And for the record, again, I didn't conjure a hurricane. It just happened when it came out. Yeah, cancer, hurricane, your cancer's going to come back when it Chapter 2 comes out. <laughs> Don't say that. That's terrible. Um, all right, no, any... no, not, not permanently. For a single week. <laughs> one more week of chemo. <laughs> um, Chris, any thoughts on the money here? I kind of threw a lot out there. Did you, uh, anything tickle your sack, or uh, you're like, um, uh-huh, sounds like numbers. No, nah, it sounds about right. I'm sure it will probably be number one again uh, this week. Uh, it's basically Halloween weekend um, so it'll probably tear it up again and then it'll be you know a quick dive after that most movies you know outside of maybe like Avengers and a few big ones they don't make it more than a couple weeks um, near yeah. the top and they start to decline pretty quickly I would say three on average is, is about the most anyone goes it's it's the rare rare thing that goes like Four weeks. We're talking something that that came out comes out like a Deadpool that comes out in February, and it just happens to be that there's yeah. nothing for another month, so it owns right. the box office. Or Black Panther would be another one. Um, but outside of that, yeah, it's after three weeks. It's you know that's the end of it. Either something big comes out that everyone goes to see, or you know just people. Everyone that went that was going to go see the thing has seen it. Yeah. I mean, it could make a, a dollar the rest of its run, and it's already a massive success. <laughs> So. Yeah, which means they're probably going to do another one, and I've given them the script for it, so there you go. All right. Um, with that said, now that I've tweaked Robert's nipples again, uh, I have a question for you, Robert. Are you ready? Let's start with our good friend Dan Merle from Screen Junkies. Oh, God. (laughs) This felt, ampersand, like a fan film. 
that managed to get everybody back that was in the original but wasn't able to really capture any of what made it special to begin with. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm going to disagree with that relatively string. I mean, I the problem is he says it feels like a fan film is some kind of pejorative and it's not. Because I think he is not inaccurate in that everyone involved in this, in the writing and directing, was clearly a fan of the original, and they used that to their strengths. As far as capturing the magic, a significant portion of the magic of the original Halloween was the time in which it was released. I mean, again, there's only whatever got to the, you know, slasher genre first type thing, and where the where that genre comes from is a matter of some debate... And I'm not, which doesn't bear a whole lot of rehashing, but again, a lot of the magic of Halloween was that it was released in 1978 and was among the first, not the literal first, but among the first slasher movies, especially that cast. And I hate to say interesting because Michael Myers doesn't have a character, but a visually intriguing antagonist. Whereas other notable slashers, uh, specifically Black Christmas, have you know kept theirs literally like in the dark for the majority of the movie. Whereas we got something slightly different here. You're never going to recapture that because it's 2018, not 1978. There's just no getting around that, and that really shouldn't be held against the film as a product for being a contemporary film rather than a what retroactive one? Like we can't go back in time. Jason Garasio of Business Insider. For a project that has been riding high with anticipation from Halloween fans, this is no way to reward them. I would profoundly disagree. This gentleman clearly seems to have not spoken with any fans of the franchise. (laughs) Just made a lot of wild assumptions there, buddy. April Wolf of Denver Westward. Too bad that Laurie's story is only one of this Halloween's two movies. Whoever made the decision to slash up some hot and horny teens to round out the movie has seriously undercut what might have been a horror achievement. That's not the worst point in the world to make. That being said, there's a fair, there's a long, in some respects, tawdry history of drunk, horny teenagers being the victims of slashers in slasher movies. Pat Padua of the Washington Post, top critic, best of oh, the best. No, <laughs> no, not this guy. No. <laughs> yes, yes, this guy. As a horror comedy, comma, it's not scary enough or funny enough. It's because it's not a horror comedy, you <laughs> jackass. <laughs> There's a significant difference between self, between being self-aware in the way that this movie very clearly is and trying to make a horror comedy. Just because a movie is self-aware does not mean it's a comedy. This movie is very aware of itself, but it's not played for laughs. The fact that you think that is... I don't know if it's a damning indictment on your cognitive abilities... <laughs> Hey, remember, he's or a top the fact critic. that you just saw Danny McBride's attachment and went, oh, it's Danny McBride, it must be a comedy. I'm going to go with that's what happened. Wild assumptions, again. Absent evidence. And speaking of ass nuggets, Chris Stuckman of ChrisStuckman.com, this fucking Self-employed guy. Self-employed loser. You get the gist of what we're doing here, Chris? I got it. <laughs> La- I hate the, there's a lot of the same people that he recycles for this bit. <laughs> Lax atmosphere. When tension begins to mount, it's undercut by misplaced humor. This is a frustrating film that gets so much right but falters with key elements. I'm again failing to understand the... I don't know. Maybe I'm. Maybe the humor was so... I, I, just, I genuinely don't understand where they're getting points of humor. Where they're getting bits that are supposed to be funny. I mean, the only thing I laughed at in this movie was... Judy Greer's bit about the world is a kind, beautiful place full of understanding (laughs) and not trying to kill you all the time. Because the world is trying to kill you. That's what it does. And it will eventually. Now let's go to Robert's spiritual father, Roger Moore of Movie Nation. uh, (laughs) 
My we- actual father would like to kill you for this reference, by the way. <laughs> Is he aware? No. Okay. But I'll tell him one of these times. There you go. With, tell him about if my pitch. He gets pitch. back from South Dakota, I might. Okay. And then tell him about my pitch for a new Halloween movie, okay? Um, Roger Moore of Movie Nation. With this crew making it, we expect a treat. But they pretty much trick us out of it. Get it? <laughs> Get it? He's he's a top critic, Chris. He's one of the best. Even my dad's dad jokes are not that bad. <laughs> you got did paid he, for that, man. Did he study Somebody under the... Somebody signed a uh, check to you related to that sentence. How dare you? Who was the critic that was on the Today Show in, like, the 80s? Gene Shallot? Shallot. That's, who, yeah. I think he studied under Gene Shallot. That was the joke <laughs> I was going for. Maybe. Uh, Allie Gray of the... Sh- that's the only acceptable reason that he arrived at this point in his life. Allie Gray of theshiznit.co.uk. Halloween is hollow and joyless, like a sad old pumpkin left out to rot. <laughs> Okay, what's this joyless crap? It's a slasher movie. What did you think? Like, were you expecting rainbows and bunnies? It's a movie about a guy who puts on a mask and violently murders people. But boy, it's sure joyless, and that's a valid criticism. Dan Geyer, of, <laughs> Dan Geyer of Chicago Daily Herald. This movie pays little attention to realistic details necessary to anchor an effective horror story. Oh, shut up. (laughs) Just shut up. Brian... Which realistic details would you prefer that anchor an effective horror story? By all means, The Descent, wherein we encounter subterranean bat creatures, humanoid bat creatures that violently murder people, Nightmare on Elm Street, where a the ghost of a previously deceased pedophile and murderer kills people in their dreams. Maybe it's Jason, and you like the thought of a half-drowned inbred hillbilly putting on a hockey mask and chopping people. You don't, or, oh, how about this? Another couple of my favorites. Maybe you actually think that there's a demonic entity that's willing to go around and slam doors on people and shake chandeliers and just terrify them indiscriminately. It's a horror movie! (laughs) Barring the horror movies that are deliberately realistic, none of them are. You moron. Okay, I have a real problem with this next one. I mean, this one, I almost didn't read it. I kind of brushed past it. And then when I gave it a good read, I was like, I don't... Wait, what? What? Rebecca Murray of Showbiz Junkies. There's not a single supporting player you'll be sad to see come to a bloody end the way you were when PJ Souls bit the dust in 1978's Halloween. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? That entire cast, save Jamie Lee Curtis as Laurie Stroud, I was waiting, you know, I was totally, totally waiting to see bite the dust. Totally. Ugh. Totally. Yeah. That's really not accurate. Uh, that's not an accurate observation at all on the part of this individual. Uh, Somebody find that person and throw, like, weak old sushi at them. <laughs> Peter Howell of Toronto Star, top critic. It might as well be James Bond behind Michael's latex mask, noticeably weathered by four decades of abuse for all the deviation from franchise formula we see on the screen. I'm... What? (laughs) Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I'm genuinely trying to figure this out for a minute. You think a movie that is so deliberately paying homage to the actual source material and original that it you you have a better argument that it's derivative than that it breaks from the genre from the conventions. Unless you're mostly familiar with again Season of the Witch or four or five or six or H two O or Resurrection. I mean, I'm sorry, there wasn't a moderately successful but ultimately irrelevant rapper to throw fists down with Michael Myers. (laughs) Where's Buster Rhymes when you need him? Brian Tellerico of Roger... Somewhere else where he should stay. (laughs) RogerEbert.com, top critic. It's just not scary. And that's one thing you could never say about the original. I'm not sure I agree with that. 
Okay, we're ending with this one. This is my favorite one right here, and it's one of my. And it's one, yeah, from one of our. It's from one of our favorites. It's so good. This is everything that made me pull. This this, this one is our Trumpiest one yet. We haven't had one of those in a while, and it and it really it. It's so good. I'm so glad that I pitched my movie that I did because this goes right along with it. Are you ready? Chris, are you ready? I'm ready. Marianne Johansson, a flick philosopher. Oh, this one. Yeah. Why? Why her? Why her? It's so terrible. Oh, this is the best. Are you ready? A minor fan fiction take on the franchise's mythology. Hey, maybe middle-aged Laurie Strode likes guns, LOL. Nowhere near as feminist or as psychologically incisive as it thinks it is. And it's not even scary. Again, I really have to stress this. It's not intended to be psychologically incisive. And the majority of traumatized people, like Laurie up were, become hypervigilant and obsessed with their own self-defense. And guess what? Guns go along with that. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Uh, I know I said that was the Being last a political blogger. Like, I'm sorry that y- you couldn't actually get your columns on you know lesbian <laughs> dance theory published in anything that would actually pay you for it. But what the hell? Why do you pollute actual film critique with this garbage? I know I said that was going to be my last one, and it really is a great one. But this really is the last one because we can't leave out Scott Mendelson of Forbes. We could. We really could. Then we'd be better <laughs> off. No, Chris needs to get the full extent of this bit. So here's old Scotty. The acting and violence are appropriately impressive, but a choppy screenplay, a lack of real-world logic. I love that I love that remark. A lack of real-world logic and mixed messages un- render this less of an update and more of a glorified fan fiction. Okay. First of all, that's the fourth fan fiction reference, right? <laughs> <laughs> It's like these people just found out that on the internet people write fan fiction and are now deciding that they have to reference it. I can't wait till they discover slash fiction. Oh, Lord. Ugh. All right. As far as mixed messages go, no. There's no real message here. There's not intended to be. So, no. Second... If the acting and the kills are that impressive, that's essentially all you want from a slasher movie. Again, I stress the okay, two things. Well, let's get a couple of things further solidified about this. It's a slasher movie, so there's a degree of real-world logic that doesn't apply. Just straight up does not apply to this and should not apply, and if you expect it to apply, you're not doing it right. Bear in mind, I even when I do other movies that I know the laws of physics don't apply to and I do my that doesn't work that way bit, I'm also happy to acknowledge that, okay, I know that doesn't work that way. Here's why it doesn't work that way, but it's a movie, so I'm prepared to kind of go along with a lot of that. What part of the real-world logic are you thinking that this violates? Did you expect them to catch the silent masked murderer on Halloween I mean, I'm genuinely curious what these people think would happen if someone like Michael Myers started doing this by the time the first responders show up to the first body he's moved on to several others like, what, do you expect precognitive like, do you believe the police to be clairvoyant like, what, what exactly do you <laughs> What exactly do you expect them to do? Boy, this mindless, psychopathic murderer is wandering around town indiscriminately killing people. I'm going to try and get ahead of this and catch him in the act before he does it again. No! They would show up. They would cordon off the scene like they do. They would get a little bit further behind in some cases. Like The actual pseudo-manhunting bits of this are surprisingly true to form. <laughs> I mean, the only thing that m- might have been missing was a media blitz. But other than that, no, this, that's, that is a horribly believable sequence, which should terrify you, by the way. <laughs> All right, I think we've, uh, we've just sufficiently beaten this horse. So next week, here on the Rattles and Broadcasting Network, 
It's Halloween week, and so we've got some treats for you. We've got Halloween Night Dance, which uh, Chris deigned to be on. We had a good time recording that show, Chris. You'll get to hear it next Monday here on the Rattle Legend Broadcasting Network. On Trial is back for our October entry, and speaking of Halloween movies, we'll be looking at the now out of continuity Halloween 2 from 1981. I'll be prosecuting, Sean will be defending. On the Metal Hammer of Doom, we'll be looking at uh, Italian progressive metal band Trick or Treat and their uh, covers album from this earlier this year, Reanimated, because it's covers month, all month long here on the Rattles and Broadcasting Network. And then November 1st, November kicks off with our uh, tribute to the anniversary of the World of Worlds broadcast. We'll be doing a commentary for Spaced... Space d- 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 Invaders. You can also uh, check out a double dose of myself and Robert. Uh, we Not only are we reviewing Halloween this week, but we'll also be reviewing Daredevil Season 3. Uh, which reminded Best me of... Season the, of Daredevil. Which reminded me of The Wire Season 3. And for that kind of expert analysis, you'll have to tune into the podcast to find out why. Why, 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 why. Because uh, well, Mark relates everything to the wire. Just about. Um, he proposed and- to his wife in the body of a dead hooker. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, well, your first wife. And then, uh, lastly, if you're, uh, we're we're doing burn the priest tomorrow, October twenty fourth, on the Metal Hammer of Doom. Their new cover is album. Uh, burn the priest is also Lamb of God. For those that don't know. It's a Legion XX or Legion 20, however you like it. Um, Check out the TV party for Hannibal Season 2 that's in the archives. Our review of Devil Driver, Outlaws Till the End. Uh, We did a whole week of Venom shows. We uh, reviewed the new Venom movie. We looked at Venom Lethal Protector. Uh, Hot Stuff Baby, Mystic Prophecy. It was a terrible week. On the Metal Hammer of Doom. And then uh, we also looked at... Deadpool, Dracula's Gauntlet, Ozark Season 2, and Power Glove continue. Lastly, the Screaming Screaming Boy's entry for this month, we looked at the rise and fall of America's dad, Bill Cosby. So that's all the news that's fit to print here. Chris, tell them where you be and where they can find you. Um, You can find me on Twitter at uh, at BrodyMan34 and I have uh, an article up on unspokendecade.com uh, it's been like it's been up there for like a year on the savage dragon i haven't really done anything else for them uh, outside of a couple podcasts um but pretty much just my twitter is at brody man 34 chris we hope you'll um deign to come back and join us next time something something tickles your sack <laughs> uh well put <laughs> appreciate <laughs> it uh all right with, with that classy outro robert take us home all right. As for myself, you can find me usually on the both this show and the 411 Ground and Pound radio show. Last week, we talked news, we talked politics, because I let Jeff go on off on a tangent. You poor and bastard. we previewed UFC Fight Night 138, which is a terrible, terrible card. We went over <laughs> why it's a terrible, terrible card, and all the terrible fights that are propagating on it. This coming Sunday, we will review that card assuming I don't kill myself while watching it, and I am not at all sure how that's going to play out. It's 50-50 at best. And we will preview UFC 230. Uh, Cormier versus Lewis. That is a bad fight poster. Just even weaker than their normal ones. (laughs) A fight card that has gone through some trials and tribulations, but is still standing at the moment totally waiting for Derek Lewis to fall out at the last minute because God, if it's if it's genuinely something involving his balls I will laugh my ass off <laughs> I would vote for he doesn't make weight that's also a possibility the man does have to cut to 265 nice so it's we'll black. preview that card hey, hey Robert 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 uh, Cormier versus Lewis is black on fat crime <laughs> I mean they're both fat that's eh, true. <laughs> Better chance I mean, Daniel, of an upset, would you Daniel say? Daniel Cormier Lewis? is the daddest man on the planet. Hey, Chris was trying to make a joke here. Let him in. No, it's not a joke. Uh, better chance of an upset, Lewis or Gustafson? Better chance, Gus. 
Gus has a much better chance than Lewis does. I was going to say, Lewis has no chance. Lewis has no chance. His takedown defense is mediocre to begin with, much less against someone with the ca- the wrestling caliber of Daniel Cormier. Can Cormier slam him? Can he get him up? Yes. He doesn't Daniel have to. Cormier He's going could. to. As I don't know as, if he will, but he could. As soon as soon as Dan Cormier shoots for the double, Derek Lewis will crumble like a pile of laundry, <laughs> <laughs> and then he'll just sit on him until Derek Lewis finally gives up from being out of breath, and his balls are too hot. I don't keep up with the news as much as I used to, so why has the Lesnar fight not been scheduled yet? Because he's still Lesnar's suspended. Not, Lesnar's not eligible to be scheduled until January of 19 because of his suspension. Gotcha. But once they get once we get past that date, they're making DC Lesnar, and that'll be DC's last people. fight. Sorry, I missed that. I'm, so, I'm sorry. He, he should just snitch on some people. They'll wipe that suspension away. No, don't 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 encourage him to fight again. <laughs> Brock Lesnar is my most favoritist fighter ever, and I don't want him back in the cage ever because he'll get killed. And I don't need him. Look, the last time against uh, I didn't even see the hunt. I don't even vaguely remember the hunt fight, but yep. b- before Plus, that was like- Alistair Overeem, and that was such an embarrassment. It made me sad. I never want to see Brock Lesnar fight a real fight again. <laughs> Let him continue to throw wrestlers around in the WWE. That's fine. Okay, I know I pitched a terrible movie, but you stop pitching terrible ideas for Brock Lesnar, you. Look, I maintained I wanted to see Brock Lesnar and Francis Ngannou. <sighs> no. Leave Brock Lesnar alone. He's old and frail. I mean, really, we all want to see Brock and John Jones. because No, we oh, don't. Yeah. No, no, oh, we don't. First John of all, they'd, would ar- kill him. they would arrest John Jones for murder by the time, you know, when that was over. It would be no, a hate crime. If you do it in the cage and you don't break any of the rules, it's legal. It's a hate crime. That's what that would be. Leave Brock nah. Lesnar alone. What has he ever done to you? Don't answer you that. Mean me personally? <laughs> let's, let's just end the show. I mean, nothing. I don't have anything against Brock. Yes, you do. But if he, he wants wishes. to fight, I want to see him fight guys of that caliber who are going to kill him. He doesn't know what he wants. He's a woman. <laughs> I mean, really, it would be interesting if it, when Brock fights Cormier, we'll see if he or Reigns is out longer. Oh, God. All right. Are we, are we done here? On the leukemia joke. <laughs> <laughs> and, and on, on, and on that unfortunate land. leukemia joke. Know. Uh, I don't know. My delivery is off. Uh, anyway, you can find so you can find me again this coming Sunday, where we will review and preview and talk any major news that comes out between now and then. Uh, and let me think. Then again, I'll again I'll be back next week. We'll wait. Is the is Daredevil this Thursday or next Thursday? It's the day after tomorrow. Day after tomorrow. So in a couple of days. I'll be back to talk Daredevil Season 3 with Mark. I'm going to try and moderate my glowing praise. Because I I loved this season. I, I've had issues with other seasons. Up, you know, They've been kind of up and down. Two had these horrible stretches where Elektra was on screen. It just killed <laughs> that season. Uh, I loved... I binged this whole thing in 13 hours. I was that compelled after I started it. So uh, uh, Mark and I will talk about that. It should be a lot of fun. And again, uh, Mark ran down most of the schedule and intimated where I'll be. Again, mostly Sundays for the 411 Ground and Pound radio show is my most most frequented show. That's where you can find me most of the time. But uh, that's it for us then. So for Chris, thank you for being here. Happy to have you. Thank you, sir. For Mark, who continues to pitch terrible, terrible ideas. Yeah, I do. I'm Robert. Thank you all very much for listening and tuning in. It's much appreciated, even though we don't know why. We don't question why. We just go along with it. Thank you much. Stay safe out there. And please continue to be well, be safe, and behave. for this podcast and the following message come from Broadway in Fort Lauderdale. Rodgers and Hammerstein's The King and I, based on the 2015 Tony Award winning production, is breathtaking and exquisite, says the New York Times. November 20th through December 2nd. Tickets at BrowardCenter.org.